Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for, um, for all that you're doing here in uh, Calvary Chapel Yuma, all that you're doing in our lives and, and are going to do. We ask, Father, that, uh, that you would uh, just bless us tonight, that you would instruct us and, and teach us as we, uh, as we look back at uh, what you um, started in the Calvary Chapel uh, movement. In Jesus' name, amen. So today... Uh, we are going over a more, more of a, a lecture, more of an instructional type of a message. Um, it is um, a little bit out of the ordinary for me, uh, but I do have a lot of stuff I want to share uh, this uh, evening. I'll try to stay uh, within the confines of the time that we usually get here. Um, but today's message is titled, What is Calvary Chapel? And, and we're having the youth sit in through this as well, because usually uh, I'm teaching the youth in, in in the back there in their room, but I want you guys to sit through this message as well so you guys can know what, you know, the beginnings of Calvary Chapel and why it's important and so on. So the title of today's message is, What is Calvary Chapel? I think that's an important question, not just for those that uh, are not aware or that familiar with the movement, but also for those of us who, you know, maybe we, we've been aware of it for quite a while. I think it, uh, the purpose of going over these things help us to, to reinforce why we believe what we believe, and also to, you know, encourage us. Somebody said, you know, in order to know where you're, where you're you know, going to end up at, sometimes you got to look back where you came from, right? And we got to look back. Why, why, why are we distinct from maybe the, the church across the street or down the road? Why are we different? And, you know, there are different denominations, different uh, movements and whatnot, and there are distinctions, but I do want to say right off, right off the bat is that when it comes to a, to a Christian uh, movement, an authentic Christian movement, what separates us are the non-essentials, okay? With, I'm not talking about cults. I'm talking about the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses here. I'm talking about, you know, uh, denominations and movements. What, what brings us together is the gospel, Jesus Christ. We, that, that should never change. That is the core of Christianity. That's what makes us Christian. The person of Christ and the work of Christ. We're saved by grace through faith, not by works, so no one can boast, the Bible says. But with that being said, while there should be, you know, uh, unity within the essentials, there, there's also gonna, there should be liberty with the non-essentials. And that includes things having to do with the end times, things having to do with uh, even creation, right? Things having to do with, uh, you know, church government and all that stuff. So those are some of the things that, we're, that I'm going to try to break down for you uh, this, uh, this evening. So let's begin here. The disclaimer, though, is this. I... You know, I, uh, I am not standing up here uh, and making myself out to be some sort of authority over what Calvary Chapel is. By no means, you know, I, I'm, I see myself as standing on the shoulders of those that are standing on the shoulders of the, the you know, the first, you know, forerunners of the movement. Those that God, uh, you know, Pastor Chuck Smith being the, the main one uh, here. So it is a privilege to be able to talk about this subject. Uh, uh, the way I came uh, to... Uh, the knowledge of Calvary Chapel was uh, in 19, not 19, 2005, that is. In 2005, um, just a year and a half before uh, or after I got saved here in Yuma, uh, I moved uh, with my wife to uh, San Bernardino. And while I was there, while I was working in Fontana, uh, while I was uh, on the road, and, and if you're familiar with, with uh, California, you know, you're in traffic for a while. And uh, so I turned on the radio one time to K-Wave 107.9. And that's when I got acquainted with uh, Pastor Chuck Smith through the radio waves and Raw Reese. And while, while I'm waiting in traffic, I, I was hearing the Word of God uh, presented through the airwaves. And, and, you know, Pastor Chuck teaching verse by verse and chapter by chapter. One of my favorite programs was uh, Pastor's Perspective, where you, you know, it was a call-in radio program. You had Bible questions, Pastor Chuck would answer them, or Don Stewart. And, and it was pretty interesting. That's how I... That's how I I grew the most. My, my seminary, my Bible college was this 1997 little Honda Accord in the middle of, you know, of traffic. You know, I grew a lot through that. So exactly a year later, in 2006, we moved back to Yuma because I felt, you know, the Lord was calling me to come back uh, home here. And we came back, and I turn on the radio again, and I hear that there's a Calvary Chapel here in Yuma. That following Sunday, I, I, you know, I grabbed my family and we came and, and we started fellowshipping here. This is back when we were, moved, we were uh, meeting at the, at the food bank. And you know what? We, here we are. And here we've been, right? So uh, that's how, the, you know, that's just my short, um, you know, brief description of, you know, Calvary Chapel and how I got acquainted with, uh, with Calvary Chapel. 
So the first thing I want to talk, talk about is the origins of, uh, of Calvary Chapel, the origins of the, the movement, and obviously I'm going to talk about the, the founder being Pastor uh, Chuck Smith. This is not a message on the Calvary distinctives. I will, you know, quote Pastor Chuck Smith in the Calvary distinctives, but by no means am I trying to give a, you know, a summary of the distinctives. But this is what Pastor Chuck Smith says in the first paragraph of the Calvary Distinctives. And the Calvary Distinctives are, uh, are basic, it's basically a book. Here's, uh, uh, you know, two pictures of, of the book. Um, if you have it, great. I don't have any copies anymore, but it basically breaks down the Calvary Chapel movement, why we believe what we believe. Um, there are free copies online that you can, you know, just Google and find out and look at them. But here's what Pastor Chuck Smith said. He said, what is it? that makes Calvary Chapel different from other Bible-believing evangelical churches. It's always good to have a grasp of the unique work that God has done in, in our fellowship. If Calvary Chapel was exactly like the church across the street, it would be better to simply merge the two. But if there are distinctives that make us different, then we have a new, unique and special place in the plan of God. Certainly there are churches that share many of our beliefs and practices. We're not renegades, but God has done a wonderful work of balance in the Calvary Chapel movement that does make us different in many ways. So with that said, the you know Calvary Chapel movement was started roughly in the late 1960s, 1967 if you want a precise number. And and it was part it really it was a part of the the Jesus movement among the hippies and what God was doing in Southern California among the you know the hippies and for you younger guys that don't know what hippies are, you know, just uh just think of long-haired, uh, peace—you know, peace-loving, pot smoking You know, um, those are the original hipsters, if you will. Not trying to say anything positive about that, but you know, these guys were uh, dissolu dissolution young people that were just out there doing all kinds of stuff, and and there's a lot of them. And God started doing something within uh, them. Now, Pastor Chuck Smith and his wife Kay went to, uh, he went at least to, to Bible College at Pacific uh, Life Bible College, I think it's called, in uh, Los Angeles. And that's, uh, you know, um, that's connected with the Four Square Movement, which is a Pentecostal movement. So he actually, Pastor Chuck started pastoring a church here in Arizona in Prescott. That's when he started off. He started off here in, in, uh, in Arizona in Prescott. And then he moved uh, maybe a few years after that to another church in Tucson and started pastoring a church in Tucson. But then the Lord called him back to, uh, I think it was towards Huntington, Huntington Beach in California, and he started pastoring a church there. Pastor Chuck's routine, usual routine, was to be somewhere pastoring for two years, and after he ran out of his two-year message series, this topical message series, he would move on to the next place. Now, believe it or not, he didn't start off as a expository teacher. He didn't start off teaching verse by verse and chapter by chapter, which is basically what most Calvary's uh, do. He says in the Calvary Distinctives that, you know, one time he picked up a copy of Haley's um, Bible. Um, what is it called? Handbook. handbook. There you go. Haley's Bible uh, handbook. And he read it. And, and there uh, Haley was talking about, you know, teaching verse by verse and chapter by chapter. And he really enjoyed that. And that helped him to stay in the church that he was at. And, and believe it or not, after he, he got done with this two, two year topical series, he started teaching verse by verse. He also, he, he does mention he picked up another, another book. Uh, it was basically an outline on, on First and Second John and so on, and that helped him too. Uh, but the point is this, the church started growing. It started growing exponentially there in California after, after he started just teach, simply teaching uh, the Word of God, you know, verse by verse and chapter by chapter. But while the church, while there was prosperity, you know, with the, with the people and, and so on and growth, the Lord was calling Pastor Chuck. The Lord opened the door for Pastor Chuck in Costa Mesa. Because if you didn't know, Costa Mesa, is the, that's the, where the, the, the original Calvary Chapel was at. Not the, not the Calvary Chapel that we know today, but there was this little, this little church in the middle of a trailer park. It was the recreational center of a, of a trailer park, by the way. And that's where, you know, people met. The capacity was maybe 90 people. And... Pastor Chuck, the Lord, you know, moved Pastor Chuck there. At first, Kay, Kay Smith didn't want to go. And, and Pastor Chuck was praying that, uh, you know, Lord, you know, if you want me to go here, you know, change her heart. And, and, and he did. She's like, all right, you know. Uh, she admitted that she was just, she didn't want to leave the, you know, what was happening in Huntington Beach over there. And, but they moved, and that was a great thing, because then the Lord started uh, working there and doing great things as well. 
Now, so where where do the the hippies come in come in, and where do uh, where does Pastor Chuck come in with them? So, if you read the distinctives, Pastor Chuck's uh, view of the hippies was like, you know, they are a waste of potential. He would tell his wife, they're you know, they would see him on the streets, and they're driving. He's driving, and honey, they're a waste of potential. What they need is a haircut and a shower. And she would turn around and tell him, you know, they need Jesus. And she really had a big heart for the for the hippies. And I think that stirred Pastor Chuck up a bit because then they started ministering to the hippies, and that's when it, that's when things started to happen. See, Pastor Chuck was more, you know, he was more of the, uh, you know, he's more reserved, more a more reserved guy. And um, but then when he got out of his shell, he, when he started ministering to you know the rejects, if you will, uh, stuff started happening. Now I'm not gonna go too deep into Lonnie Frisbee if you're familiar with that name. He was a, a, a specific. That guy looked like Jesus, like as far as what we would think Jesus looked like. He was hip, long hair, long, uh, long beard, and I think God used him greatly alongside Pastor Chuck to sort of get the momentum going. Pastor Chuck was like the Bible teacher. Lonnie Frisbee was uh, the guy you know with the gifts, and 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 stuff started happening. That combination was uh, formidable, and God did great things to uh, through them. Let me show you a few pictures here of the you know the early uh, movement. If I can show the one with the tent, there you go, the, the tent meetings here. That little, uh, you know, the, the original Calvary Chapel building was too small to hold all these hippies that were just coming in droves, bus loads. So they had these, you know, these tent meetings as well, and uh, th- this place uh, got packed. Let's show that, that image. Here's, a, here's another image there. So you can see, you know, God was working through the good. This is a God thing. This is a, a genuine revival here in the 1960s um, that was happening. Let's look at, at another picture. From the inside. Now, this is actually the the, the Calvary Chapel building after they, they uh, you know, did construction and made it bigger. So you can see, you know, this is uh, pretty neat, pretty interesting. Now, with uh, a new, with a lot of new believers and coming to Christ and so on, you're also going to have a lot of baptisms, right? Because baptism is a, this the the first work that you should do after you believe. Let's look at those baptisms there. I don't know if it's Huntington Beach or what, but it's a, it's a beach there, and there was a lot, of, a lot of people that were coming to Christ. Pastor Chuck there is, you know, pointing to, to Jesus and, you know, awesome stuff, awesome memories that, uh, you know, that uh, a lot of the people that were there uh, still have. Now, one of the things that, um, that I remember, one of the stories is that with, uh, with all these people coming in and also having a portion of people that were already there that were more reserved as well, right, that have been Christians longer, there's going to be that friction, right? And, and I remember the story when um, a group of the people from the church complained to the elders, and the elders brought it up to Pastor Chuck about the hippies coming in barefoot and getting the, the, the carpets dirty and so on. And what Pastor Chuck did was he pulled out the carpet, so they wouldn't, you know, complain anymore. And I say that because the next thing I want to talk about is atmosphere. The atmosphere of, uh, of Calvary Chapel is not the same atmosphere as, uh, as a lot of other churches. And, and, and I think a lot of, the, um, because of this, a lot of the churches today are, have been influenced to have that, that laid back, that come as you are type of uh, uh, atmosphere, if you were that environment, a non-judgmental environment when it comes to those, you know, those types of things, how how, uh, you know, what people are wearing and so on. Um, I think the only time, I mean, we don't make a big deal about what people wear. I mean, people can come in their Hawaiian shirts and uh, flip-flops, uh, or if you want to be come in your suit and tie, your khakis, your blazer, go for it, right? But there shouldn't be any, you know, any judgment in regards to things of that nature. Read Romans 14, great passage, talking about things of that nature. I think the only... The only thing I can say as far as attire when it comes to church is when, when your attire can uh, cause somebody else to stumble, right? So if you're attire, and this is in the area, I think, of modesty. You, I mean, we, as far as, since I've been the pastor here, I haven't, I haven't had to tell my wife to talk to another lady to cover it up because that really hasn't been an issue. But it's one of those things, right? If you know, if you if you get out of the realm of modesty and you're intent, you're you're stumbling other men, then you know what you're going to get talked to in a loving way. But you know, for the most part, you you come here and worship. We're, we're here to worship in in, in spirit, uh, in truth. And that's what worship is, right? Church should never be the uh, you know who, who's the best dressed, who's the best dressed. But some people make it that they really do. Um, now. 
in regards to, uh, to atmosphere, I want to talk about mainstream denominations and legalism. Mainstream denominations and legalism. What do I mean by that? Well, the rest of the churches that were not taking advantage of what God was doing uh, with the hippies during that time, they were looking down and, you know, talking, criticizing, the, you know, Pastor Chuck and other churches that did get involved with this. And, you know, they, they were a bit uh, legalistic, if you will. They were saying, oh, you know, they serve, you know, Coke and sandwiches with their communion and things of that nature. You know, they, they always found something to, uh, to criticize. But I think, you know, it always goes back, and even today I still see it, it goes back to churches wanting, wanting to major on the minors. Wanting to major on the minors, and that's something we got to avoid, right? Now, I understand, you know, there, every church has their own rules that are not necessarily in the Bible, and they, do, they put up those walls for protection. I understand that, but if God is trying to do something to, to add to the body, we need to, you know, uh, reconsider those things as long as they're not biblical essentials. The atmosphere, liberty stumbling, and so on. Now, with the, to the whole talk about as atmosphere and all that, I want to talk about worship as well, because that's a big thing also. During that time, you know, there was hymns and, you know, and there's still hymns today. They're still in some churches. There's nothing wrong with hymns. If you want to do hymns, go for it, do hymns. Um, but one of the, 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 the significant changes about Calvary Chapel, or that makes Calvary Chapel distinct, is that Calvary Chapel is credited for bringing in the contemporary music into the Christian world, okay? If you, you know, you can just Google contemporary Christian music, and usually, you know, three out of four, three out of five times, you'll, you'll see the name Calvary Chapel linked to it. And it was uh, Chuck Gerard from a Love Song. That was a band um, back then, a rock band, hippies. You know, the guy had just gotten out of jail, and, and now he got saved, and he was there, and He's got his guitar and all that, and Pastor Chuck was like, hey, do you want to you wanna lead us in worship? He gave him a big opportunity doing that. So he left. The only thing was he left his electric guitar because it was like a, a big, uh, it would be a big uh, change for pe people to accept right away. So he left his electric guitar, and he just brought his regular, you know, acoustic guitar, and he started playing and, and so on. But it changed the vibe. It, it, was, it was worship music. I mean, the lyrics were glo God-glorifying and so on. And actually, we had uh, we actually had Chuck Gerard uh, here in Calvary Chapel Yuma when we were at the food bank, maybe three, four years ago. I think that's a video that got the most hits on on our channel, like seventeen thousand six hundred some hits, a lot of hits. But um, yes, worship you know, worship can be hymns. I think one thing to understand is that the hymns they were contemporary music when they were being sung, when they were recorded in the Bible. That was the contemporary music of the time. Now, today, you know, the, the, the lyrics, I think, should always be God-glorifying. They should not contradict the scriptures. I think there should be measures that we should have. Let me give you three of them here when it comes to worship. Three questions that we should ask ourselves. Is it biblical? That is, do, do the lyrics uh, not teach something that is unbiblical? Now, some, some uh, Christian um, worship leaders do take some liberty in using uh, synonyms of other words, to speak to the culture. So I think, you know, just um, be cautious of that. Uh, number two, does it glorify God? Is the, the worship music that you're singing, does it glorify the Lord? And that's what worship music is. It's meant to glorify God. It's not for you. Remember the story about this couple that goes, to, goes up to the, uh, to the pastor after church, and they're like, we didn't really like the worship music. And he's like, good, it wasn't for you. You know, It's for God. It's for God. It's to glorify God, right? Number three, does it edify the body? Worship music is, is, is to edify, you know, the, the body of Christ. But when Joseph comes up here, his goal is not necessarily to sing a good song, but to, to, to bring you into the presence of the Lord, right? Bring you into the presence of, of Christ to, to, uh, to worship him. Now, the problem, and this is what, I, in every section, I, wanna, I do want to give a section of uh, where to draw the line when it comes to these things. And I think... Um, it's not so much worship being out of order, but people, worshipers being out of order during worship. And Pastor Chuck had a lot to say about this, but the issue we take is when, when you as a worshiper during that time of worship, you, you start taking the attention away from God to yourself by doing something, you know, that nobody else is doing in the room. And usually it's to get attention, 
Sometimes there is uh, mental, uh, mental issues. Some people will come in here and they'll start. I remember a while back, Steve is pretty familiar with the story, a while back, uh, a few months ago, you know, a lady during first service, she just started yelling out something and she got everybody else's attention, right? We're already ADD. We don't need, you know, that as well. So, um, so we had to talk to her. He's like, hey, you know, you don't want to disrupt, you know, uh, the, the, the message when God is trying to speak to, uh, to his people, things of that nature. And Pastor Chuck basically said, look, if you want to run around during worship and do all kinds of stuff like that, well, you know, there's, I'm pretty sure there's plenty of churches that, uh, that can facilitate that for you. But he talked about not, you know, this not happening here. You don't want to distract. That's our, that's our only thing. Worship should be a, and the teaching of the word as well as worship. It, it should be a no distraction zone, right? The Holy Spirit doesn't uh, interrupt uh, himself. Speaking of teaching, that leads us into the subject of teaching. And this is a big one for Calvary Chapels as well. Because the main emphasis with, uh, with Calvary Chapels is, is actually that, the, the, the teaching and preaching of the word of God. We are known uh, for that, the verse-by-verse verse and chapter-by-chapter chapter, uh, teaching. That's called expository uh, teaching. 1 Timothy 4.13 says, Devote yourselves to the public reading of Scripture, and that's what we do every Sunday, to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. This is, this is uh, Paul speaking to, to Timothy, a younger guy. He's speaking to him and he's telling him, you know, that that, that, that should be the, what the church should be devoted to. We should emphasize uh, the word of God in our meetings. That's why we don't have a 45-minute time of singing and a 15-minute time of teaching the Bible because the emphasis is the word of God. You know, Jesus talks about that a lot. But Acts 20:27 20, says, Paul says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. That's what the Bible says. The whole counsel of God. There is no Bible verse that will tell you, you need to teach verse by verse and chapter by chapter and book by book. You're not going to find it, okay? There is one in, uh, in Numbers that's, you know, close, but not really. But Acts 20, 27 ta talks about, um, you know, declaring the whole counsel of God. And in my opinion, the best way to declare the whole counsel of God is to teach through the Bible, right? Through Genesis, through, uh, from Genesis to, to Revelation. I think that's the best way to teach the whole uh uh, you know, the whole counsel of God. Now, there are, there are several ways to teach the Bible. There are different uh, ways to teach it. Um, there's a topical way to teach the Bible. A lot of uh, churches teach topically. If they don't teach verse by verse, they teach topically. Topically just means that you have a topic that you want to teach on. Let's say, I don't know, uh, somebody say a topic. Joy, joy right? So we would go over the passages that talk about joy. Galatians 5 talks about joy, right? And, then, and joy as well in the Old Testament. So we would go through different passages. So you'd be going through a lot of passages during the, uh, during the message or during the series. But there's also textual teaching. Not too many, many people are familiar with textual um, sermon series. And sometimes we try to be textual, but we end up going somewhere else. The Elisha series, uh, this sort of character study, was a bit textual because it wasn't necessarily, you know, chapter by chapter or book by book, but it did deal with the with a specific uh, theme, and that's what textual. Is. Textual is similar to verse by verse and chapter by chapter, except it's not always chapter by chapter and and book by book. If that makes uh, sense. Now the third one is a no no. You don't want to be springboarding, and what I mean by that is uh, the springboarding preacher is the person that goes up here. And, and, and just starts talking randomly about how their week was, you know, and, and how they feel and how the, they feel the Lord is leading them to do this and that. It's, it's just a lot of rambling. And I think, in my opinion, is uh, like Jane Vernon McGee say, said, you know, it's just lazy preachers. They don't study. They don't do the work of, uh, of uh, studying, you know, being ready in season and out of season. But at the same time, we're not, I mean, if you guys are familiar with Calvary Chapel, I'm not, I don't come up here on Sundays and just read verses and say, you know, well, you know, I hope the Holy Spirit gives you the understanding. No, right, we, we, we do the work. We, 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 uh, we, we jump into the Word and we see what's in there. And that's what we call inductive Bible study. Inductive Bible study can be divided into three things. Observation, 
What does it say? Interpretation. What does it mean? An application. What do I do about it? You know those points that I give you on Sundays, the more highlighted ones? Those points are the, the application that I get, and I give them to you, and sometimes they rhyme because I want them to stick. They rhyme for a reason. Because I want them to stick because that's the main application. But, I'm, but the, you know, the Holy Spirit can speak to you through something that maybe I didn't emphasize, and that's how the Holy Spirit uh, uh, works. Nonetheless, every pastor is different. Not all Calvary chapels are created equal or, or the same. Um, there are some pastors that, you know, that, that are like Skip Heitzig. He's a storyteller from Calvary Chapel, Albuquerque. He's great at story. I, you know, I tell my wife, I wish I was a better storyteller. And I'm not. I'm more of a, you know, um, exhortation type of a, a preacher. But uh, the storytellers, you know, they'll, they'll, it, it, you'll leave the, the message feeling like, man, I just, I just learned a few different stories. And I got the Word of God um, as well. So different pastors have different gifts. Some have the gifts of exhortation. Some pastors have the gift of evangelism. And those messages, you're always going to feel like you got resaved or, you know, um, you know, you're, you're definitely going to get the gospel and you're definitely going to end with, the <clears throat> with an altar call and so on. But the emphasis here is, is the Word of God. That's, how, uh, that's what we're about, right? Being the Word of God. Jesus said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by your truth, your Word is truth. The more we get into the Word, the more the Word gets in, in, into us, right? That's why it's important to be, open up our Bibles in the morning and, and, and you know, meet, God, meet with God every morning and, and get into the Word, and we'll, we'll see that we'll get more of that peace that comes through being in the Word and growth. And I think this leads us into the topic of outreach. Outreach and, and being uh, mission-minded uh, and so on. One of the things that Calvary chapels are known, are, are known by are their lack of using gimmicks and you being seeker-friendly. Okay, I haven't been to a cover chapel that is seeker friendly. And what I mean by seeker friendly, if that's a new term for you, a seeker friendly church is a church that changes a lot of the essentials to fill seats. Okay, they change a lot of the like like for example, if I wanted to fill seats here, I would probably invest in a billboard and say free beer this Sunday at Calvary Chapel, right? Or I would get, you know, something that was uh, appeasing and relevant to society today to bring people here. But, you know, the Bible never calls us to do things of that nature. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that God adds to the church those who are being saved. And if you read right before that, the church is doing four things, right? Acts 2.42, they're being in the Apostles' Doctrine. That's the Bible. They're, they're praying. They're their, you know, communion and, and their fellowshipping. They were going from house to house, breaking bread and so on. And when the church is that community that is in the Word of God and doing the things of God, then naturally there is that organic spiritual growth that we're looking for. I hate gimmicks. I hate pragmatism. I hate, I don't want to be that, that person that, that does things very mechanically in order to just to fill seats and chairs. But, but I see it often here. I'm not going to not his name. I'm not gonna name names, but uh, but I see it often. You know, churches just give in to, you know, they they strive to gain. And Pastor Chuck said this. This always stuck to me. He said, you know, if you strive to gain, you're gonna strive to maintain. If if you're using something to bait, you know, clickbait to bring people in, you're gonna have to keep giving giving them that that clickbait that uh, that stuff to keep them here. If entertainment is what brought them here, you're gonna have to keep them entertained to keep them here, right? But if it's the word of God. If they're coming because of the word of God, because, you know, yeah, a friend invited them or whatever, and, and, and they heard God speak to them, they came to Christ here, you know, sheep go where the grass is green, right? Where the pastures are, you know, are, are plentiful. And that's what we need. It's the word of God. And sheep beget healthy sheep, beget healthy sheep. And that's what we want, right? We want to grow in the word of God. That's what we want to make it about. But it's not just, okay, just Bible and no spirit, there's something about the Spirit as well. Let me read you this quote from Pastor Chuck Smith. This is a little bit bigger, so I don't think, I think most of you might not be able to read this. I didn't have time to make it smaller. But it says, Calvary Chapel believes in teaching the Word of God through the power of the Spirit of God, which changes the lives of the people of God. If you have just, if you have just the Spirit emphasis with no Word and no foundation in the Word, then you are leading the people into experiences only, which are shallow. If you have just the Word of God without the Spirit, then you are leading people into dead orthodoxy. 
It takes the power of the Spirit of God to make the changes, but it takes the Word of God to give the substance and to give the foundation. It is that blending of the Word of God and being taught through the power of the Spirit of God that brings the changes in, in the people. Does that make sense? We, we, we need both. And usually if you, if you emphasize more of the, of the Spirit, sometimes you're going to end up with a lot of feelings and experiences. If you emphasize more of the Word and no Spirit, you're going to end up being um, like the cessationists that teach that, you know, the Spirit is no longer working today like, it, like He was or in the early church. And we'll talk about, we'll dive into that in a little bit here. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is serving. We've been talking about serving on Sundays um, for the past two Sundays at least, you know, humility and service, and that's a big thing, right? Serving the Lord. I think part of being a Christian means that you, you're going to have to serve. You're going to have to ser serve, the, serve the body, serve those around you, humble yourself. We had a, I mean, we have a, a suffering servant, right? Jesus said, we just read it on Sunday. He's like, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, right? He served all the way to the, to the grave. So we take service um, very seriously here. There are many ministries that you can become a part of. Uh, I don't think I can name them all by memory, but you know you have the you have the greeter greeters ministry, you have the ushers ministry, you you know you have a, um, uh, the teaching ministry here with the with the youth and with the children, the security ministry, janitorial ministry, prison ministry, rehab ministry, you know, um, an outreach ministry that is just starting up uh, pretty soon as well. A more intentional outreach, going out of town outreach as well type of ministry, but all kinds of ministries, right? So you can know what gift, find out what gift you have, but more importantly, have that heart of service, right? Because it's pointless to have a big head with knowledge and not have that, 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 uh, that humility and that love for the rest of the, the body. So what do we need? What do we emphasize when it comes to, to service here in the body of Christ? We want to go back to the Bible, right? Acts chapter 6, verse 3 says this, and this is when, you know, the church was... Uh, you know, it, it was growing. This is a, the mega church here at the beginning, but it was full of, uh, full of new believers, right? So there was a problem, and they established what we call deacons. And it says, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. The business being spoken of here was, you know, uh, with the tables and blessing the, the, uh, the widows, you know, with bread and so on. Um, <clears throat> But it was a ministry in the church, a legitimate ministry, but it had qualifications, right? What were the qualifications? What were the, 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 the requirements, if you will? They needed to be of good reputation, of good rapport, one translation says. So what that means is, if you want to serve, let's say, Calvary Chapel Yuma, and all your, your Facebook feed is just, you know, a lot of uh, cussing and a lot of uh, immoral stuff, and, and a lot of things that would say, hey, is this guy really a Christian? Then that would not be of good rapport, would it? Would it? It would not be of good report. Uh, so one of the things that we do at Calvary Chapel Yuma is we try not to lay hands on somebody too quickly. Okay, We, we want to give you more than a week after being saved to start teaching the kids. Okay, I think parents appreciate that. Um, full of the Holy Spirit as well. That's, I think, the main one. Right When we get saved, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. But being full of the Holy Spirit is more than just the indwelling. It's the... The, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, it's, it's displaying, it, part of it is displaying the, the fruits of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, long-suffering, gentleness, and all those nine fruits there. Um, but, but being full of the Holy Spirit is important because, you know, the reason we have the dove, the reason the, the, the dove has been the, um, the main logo for Calvary Chapel is because of the dependency that, uh, that we have on God, the Holy Spirit, Right? Last, uh, last Wednesday, that was a subject with the youth. We were studying the, uh, the subject of pneumatology, the Holy Spirit, and so on, how he is a person. He's not a force, and, and we looked at the gifts and so on. But what I'm trying to say with this is, um, you know, we, we, are not, we don't have flesh power. We have God power, and it comes through the Holy Spirit. And that is, that is important, very important. But also notice it says wisdom. Wisdom is also important. The difference between knowledge is wisdom, and, and wisdom is this. You know, wisdom is, is knowledge rightly applied. Some people know the Bible, but do they know how to apply it in their lives? That's what wisdom is. So you need the wisdom for whatever ministry you're doing, but you need the spirit in filling, and you need, uh, you need to be of good report. You need to have grown enough to be trusted. That leads us into the subject of, uh, 
of the gifts, the subject of the spiritual gifts. We, as a, as a church, we're not Pentecostal, okay? We're not, the Pentecost, we're not Pentecostals, but we're not Baptists either. Uh, what well, we are, we're somewhere in the middle. We, Pastor Chuck always talks about, you know, keeping it balanced. Um, we are what some call continuationists or continuous, if you want a shorter word, continuationists. And that word, the emphasis there is in, in continuing, right? We, we don't believe, as the cessationists believe, that, that somehow the Holy Spirit stopped working, you know, after the, the, the apostles died out. We don't believe that. We believe that, that the Holy Spirit continues. The, this is the church age. The Holy Spirit is still here. People are still getting saved. Jesus is not back yet. So then the Holy Spirit still indwells people and he empowers people. We believe that wholeheartedly. And I think the Bible teaches that. And I'll show you a verse here. But our brothers and sisters in Christ who are true believers, who might, you know, they, they don't, some of them don't, don't believe what we believe. And that's fine. That, you know, that's fine if they don't want to uh, believe that. In my opinion, I think they're quenching the Spirit. And, and uh, the thing is that sometimes when we, when we say, well, you know, those gifts aren't for today, he, they, they, they really emphasize the fact that tongues are not a gift anymore and, and also um, the, the gifts of healing are not, are not active anymore. The, the more apostolic gifts, if you will. They say, well, those are just the sure gifts, the, the, the sure signs that they, they were only to, to give, you know, credit to the Word of God, that these guys were, were authentic. And just because something is that doesn't mean it's only that. Does that make sense? Just because the gifts serve that purpose doesn't mean that that was their only purpose. Now, they use one verse to support their view, and I'll show it to you as well. I don't want to be too biased, but the verse that they use is in 1 Corinthians 13.10. This is the verse they use. <clears throat> but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. And they're saying that I don't disagree with them with uh, that which is in part, part. It's talking about the gifts and so on. I think those will be done away. The question is when. And it goes back to that word perfect. What, does, what is that perfect thing? They say it's the Bible. When the Bible has been composed and fully finished, then you don't need the gifts because you have the Bible. That's all you need is what they're saying. But that's kind of hard to, to read into that text because... Paul, not long after that, starts talking about, you know, seeing Christ as he is and, and so on. So I think the perfect thing here is uh, the coming of Christ, the, the glorification, our new bodies and so on. We, we, obviously, you're not going to need a gift of, uh, of healing if you've got a glorified body, right? If everybody else has a glorified body. So, so that's where we differ. Now, in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, let's, let's see that verse. 1 Corinthians 1, seven. notice what Paul says to the Corinthians. He says, now you have every spiritual gift. They're not just the apostles, they're, you know, believers, and cardinal believers at that. You have every spiritual gift uh, you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. That to me, just reading that verse, implies that, hey, they're going to have those gifts till the coming of the Lord. I mean, there is no other passage that would say that they're going to stop unless you're reading into it something that's not really there. So this is one of the passages that, you know, talk about the, the, uh, the gifts. If this is an important subject for you, another thing that they say is, well, you know, if you go back to the early church writings, and that means the uh, 2nd, 3rd, 4th century Christians, well, the gifts were, they said that the gifts had ceased already. But if you, if you study that, that's not true. Because there are articles, or quotes, excuse me, from different uh, early church leaders that say that the gifts were still active in the early church. So that sort of cancels itself out. So what's the deal with the gifts? How come we see more of the, church, uh, the gift of teaching than maybe the gift of tongues today? And I think that all the gifts are still active. I think uh, one thing to understand is that with the gifts, God also gave instructions. That's uh, one of my sub, sub points here. With gifts comes instruction. So here's the thing to know, very important. The Bible is the word of God. It's the Word of God. The Holy Spirit inspired the Bible, right? But the, the, the Word of the Spirit is not going to contradict the work of the Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit is not um, schizophrenic. Does not, he does not contradict himself. So the Bible doesn't just tell us what we can do in the Spirit, but it tells us how to do it. 1 Corinthians 14, for example, talks about speaking in tongues, right? It talks about being orderly and prophesying as well. You know, if somebody's speaking forth and giving maybe a word of a, a sense of a futuristic word as well, um, 
and tongues and so on, people need to do it in order. Not everybody should be talking at the same time when it comes to things of that nature. And that's so the whole body can be edified. So the, the, the way to see tongues is this. Tongues, yes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a spiritual language. It's a prayer language to God. But also it can edify the rest of the body if we can interpret it. And the Bible talks about having that gift and then having the gift of interpretation. And I think that the same person can have both gifts if the Lord wills it and gives it to them. So 1 Corinthians 14 talks about that, you know. When somebody speaks in tongues publicly, out loud, then somebody else in the room needs to pray and ask that they could interpret it or that person should interpret it in English or whatever language the body of believers are there uh, speaking so we can be edified. I have, I have, uh, I have heard the, the gift of tongues exercise before. And it was at a pastor's conference in, uh, in Costa Mesa a few years ago. And after Pastor Brian Broderson gave his message and, and you know, um, he gave the opportunity for, you know, people to go up for prayer or if anybody had anything to say, for them to say it. So this is a big, you know, Calvary Tropical Costa Mesa is a pretty big church. And it was packed and um, there's hundreds, you know, I think definitely over a thousand pastors there. So I remember distinctly one pastor to my right he said something I didn't understand out loud. He spoke for about 30 seconds. And right after he sat down and, and stopped talking, another guy, another pastor, far to the left, he started speaking in English for the same amount of time. And what he said, and this went on with different guys, you know, it, it was not planned out. It went on for, for a little while, for about 20 minutes, people, different people talking and then others interpreting in order. And all the things that they said were not crazy random things, right? But it was, uh, it was stuff that glorified God. It was like, you know, just praises to the Lord. Nothing that contradicts the, the Bible um, or anything of that nature. So I've seen it. I don't have that gift. I know some of you guys have that gift. And you, you know, you exercise it as, uh, as the Bible says. But that's just something, you know, I wanted to make sure I shared uh, uh, with you guys. So what's the next thing I want to talk about? The gift of giving. No, not the gift of giving. I'm going to talk to you about giving in general. Giving in general, uh, I had a note here, but I was like, nah, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> I was going to say, we especially welcome the gift of giving here, but I was going to say, I'm kidding. You know, um, ironically, you know, I, we, we don't, that's the thing, we don't really talk about giving, unless it's, you know, unless we're going over a passage that talks about giving in the Bible, we, we, we try to avoid the appearance of trying to, you know, pressure you to give. That's not, that's not what church should ever be about. If you ever go to a church and somebody's up here trying to tell you to give and they're passing, and I've been to them, you know. That as a new believer, those are the kind of churches that I was going to at first. And they pass the basket around several times and, and they bring out the cardboard thermometer and they said, somebody here, I know somebody here is going to give, you know, a pledge of $1,000 or whatever. And be careful with that. Don't go back to that place. Because the Bible says otherwise, right? 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. I know if somebody's twisting my arm to give, I'm not going to give cheerfully. Okay? So that's something, you know, the context of this verse is, is you know, a, a relief fund for the church in, uh, in, in Jerusalem. They were, you know, they were suffering financially. So Paul's like, look, guys, I'm going to go. I'm going to pick up the collection to help out this other church. But, you know, when you give, you know, don't give out of pressure. Just, you know, give cheerfully. Um, another passage in Matthew 6.34, and this is Jesus speaking. He says, when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private. Give your gifts um, in private. This is uh, Matthew 6.34. I, I think I forgot to put it up. But Jesus basically says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Translation, when you're giving, don't brag about it. Don't say, hey, look, look at how much I'm giving. Pastor Albert, look, where, where's the offering box? You've been coming here for five years. You know where the offering box is. So, and I say that because, I say that because, uh, you know, sometimes what happens is that people want to motivate the pastor or the church leaders in their giving, Okay. It's, it's sad to see, but, but that happens. So we don't want to give uh, the impression here that that's going to happen here. We don't want to make an environment of that. I don't know what anybody gives, and I don't want to know what anybody gives. You know, we do have people that handle that ministry of incoming. But the point is, this is for you and God. Whether, you know, whether you're giving your tithing or your offering, that's between you and the Lord. We do want to give you the opportunity. So what we do here at this Calvary Chapel, 
first service, we don't, we don't pass the, the basket. People usually just give them in the back or when they come in or when they leave. During second service, we do offer the, you know, the basket. And, and that's been working so far. But I've talked to people that say, hey, Albert, why don't you just get rid of it altogether and, and just trust in the Lord? And then I've talked to other people that are like, well, why don't you pass the basket in first service too? So I think, you know, to keep it balanced, just, just, let's just leave it how it is and, you know, not pressure people to give. But again, at the same time, it's a form of worship. You need to understand that God, part of giving is, is worship to the Lord. Next is government. Government, church government. What's the whole deal with that? So the Bible gives us these principles when it comes to church government. The Bible doesn't give us the exact, you know, blueprint on how the church government should look when it comes to pastors and elders and deacons. It just says, you know, establish elders in every city and so on. Um, so usually down the road, 2,000 years later, diff, di there are different churches with different governments. Some are congregational-led churches. I think I have maybe a, a, an outline for this. If I don't, okay, so this is a, the, the Calvary Chapel one, you know, the comparison between the Moses model and the Calvary Chapel government. I guess, we, you know, we can show this one as well. But usually there's the congregational-led churches where it's the people that tell the pastor what to do, okay? And usually, well, I see those pastors as hirelings. Um, and then there are the, the elder-led churches where it's, uh, so you got the congregation, then you have the pastor, and then you have the board of elders that basically tell the pastor how things are going to run, and then, the, you know, the rest of the body. Now, the Calvary Chapel model is like the Moses model, or the elder, the overseeing elder, the elder model. It doesn't mean that there aren't any elders and other elders don't get to input or whatever, but it does mean that there is one head elder or head overseer, and that's myself here, the senior pastor, or the lead pastor, as some call it. This is not unique to Calvary Chapels. There's many other churches that have that same model. But that's the thing. You know, Jesus is a head, you know, the, the head pastor. I'm the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the under pastor. And then you have the elders and, and the board and the congregation. You know, I have a board here. Part of uh, in my board here is Bob and, and, and Steve. They're part of my board. And then they have other elders as well. So when I make big decisions, I don't just make them by myself. I, I, I go to the advisory board and I say, hey, what do you guys think about this? Is this, is this person a good candidate to raise up into this position? Or, you know, sh should we move over here or whatever, right? So it's not, I'm not a dictator. But at the same time, I'm not a hireling either. I, I'm doing what the Lord wants me to do. And I think we have a, we have, we're blessed with the, with the elders that we have here in the, and the deacons. Next is a pastorate. What do I mean by pastorate? How do you become a pastor? How do you become a Calvary Chapel pastor? Well, the Calvary Chapel pastor way, at least the, 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 the original way was, well, if the Lord is doing something in your life, then God is going to provide, where God is guiding, God will be providing. Now, back then, this happened, this is before Pastor Chuck died. But before, if the Lord was calling you to be a pastor, he would be setting up the way he would confirm it in your heart, and then the doors would be opening, right? So what you would do if you wanted to be a Calvary Chapel pastor is you'd call up Pastor Chuck in Costa Mesa, and you'd say, yeah, I think the Lord's, I wanna, we want to be a Calvary Chapel. I think the Lord is leading me to do this. And Pastor Chuck would just say, you know, well, you know, God speak to you. And do you believe in the, well, we believe the distinctives. And he's like, yeah, it's all right, you know, good to know. And that was it. And if it was from the Lord, then God would bless it. If it wasn't, then it would die out. But do you see what I'm saying? It was very organic. So this is what I'm saying. Bible college, seminary, seminary. Okay, some of the, Bible college more so is good. Now, those things aren't necessarily requirements for being a pastor, not in the Calvary Chapel movement. Organically, you know, if you're in the Word of God, this is, I mean, this is the higher knowledge that we need. Being in the Word of God, there is no greater knowledge than this. Seminary will teach you how to outline, maybe. Seminary will teach you, you know, how to organize and use different words to, you know, organize theology. But that's it, really. You're not going to learn what you what the, God wants you to learn on the, if you're not intentionally being in the, in the Word of God. And, that, and I'm, I'm talking from experience here. You want to be led by the Holy Spirit. So the way you become a pastor at Calvary Chapel is if God is already doing something in your life, and what the elders do, and myself, is if we see God working in your life in that direction, and we're, we're going to send you out somewhere to be a pastor somewhere, we're going to lay hands on you. And all we're doing, we're not necessarily making you a pastor. We're, we're acknowledging that God is doing something in your life. 
So it's not just you saying, oh, I think God wants me to be a pastor, but nobody else thinks that, right? Um, no, it, it, God is going to confirm it. God is going to confirm it with the rest of his, uh, his body. So here's the other thing I need to talk about. And it's important that I talk about this, you know. What's the deal with women pastors? And I'll bring it up. Women pastors. What's, what's up with that? There are no women pastors. Not biblical women pastors. Now, there are women that lead churches today. They, they, they are the, the head, head, they'll refer to themselves as the, the main pastor. But are, is there any biblical support for that? There isn't. Actually, the Bible says contrary to females being pastors. And it's not a cultural issue. It's not a, well, men are better than women issue. It's not a patriarchal issue. It's a creation issue. Okay? And what I mean by that is what Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 14. This is Paul saying, this is God's word, not man's word. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. And that's, you know, to be an elder, the requirement is to be able to teach and to have authority over the rest of the body. Or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Notice that. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into trans transgression. So it's not a cultural issue. This is a creation issue, right? If we want to know about marriage, we go back to Genesis and we look at the first marriage. But if we want to know about the order in the house or in the church, we go back to Genesis as well. And that's what Paul, that's what Paul does here. It's, 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 you know, there's something about Adam not, Adam sinned, no doubt, but he wasn't deceived. But I'm not going to go into, well, you know, can women be more easily deceived than men? I'm not going to go into that subject uh, today. But that's what God's Word says. So here at Calvary Chapel, Calvary Chapel Yuma or any other Calvary Chapel, we don't have what you call women pastors. So here's the question. What can women do? What can women do? They can do about everything else other than that, I think. The Bible talks about, uh, you know, there are, there's like a Phoebe, I think is her name. She was like a deacon. Um, you have, uh, you know, the daughters of, of uh, Philip. They were prophetess. They, they, they spoke, you know, they did things of that nature. Um... There, the women are called to teach other women. Women are call, called to teach children, you know. Uh, but as far as the main pastor, there, there aren't any female pastors, okay? And that's, if we're going to be honest to the Word of God, you know, you're not going to make excuses for it. You're just going to do what the Bible says. And, and that's all I'm saying here. But you're going to find, you know, sometimes uh, our Hispanic brothers and sisters in Christ, because a lot of them are Pentecostal and charismatic, when they, you know, come, when we cross paths, they'll, they'll and they know my wife uh, is, uh, you know, well, you know, she's my wife, they'll refer to her as la pastora. That means, you know, basically the female version of pastor. You know, and she, she, you know, she gives, you know, she says, oh, okay, how you doing, whatever. But she doesn't follow through with that or, or say, hey, you know, don't call me pa pastor because I'm not a pastor. Though, uh, though I tell her all the time, but, you know, it's fine. <laughs> she, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's just one of those, just one of those things, you know. Um, it's one of those things where, you know, it's, it's not really an essential, you know, I think it's essential, but it's, it's one of those things where we can give grace uh, to others. Lastly, I know, I'm, uh, I know it's past 8 o'clock, but this is our last uh, subject. And we're going to use this video as a reference for anybody, because some people have been coming to church, to Calvary Chapel Yuma, and they're not familiar with what we believe. So this video is going to be put up and used for that, you know. We don't really have a crash course for new believers and, and people that are coming to Calvary from different denominations. So this is going to sort of serve as that. So the last thing that I have here is the subject of end times or eschatology. What is Cal where does Calvary Chapel land on when it comes to the end times uh, scenario? So we are premillennial. What that means is that we believe in uh, the literal reign of Christ. We're still waiting for Jesus to come back and reign on earth for 1,000 literal uh, years. So we believe that, that, um, that he is still to come. Okay? We're also pre-tribulational. And what that means is that we believe in a pre-trib rapture. We believe in seven years of, uh, of you know, the, when, when the earth is going to be judged, the Antichrist and all that stuff. All that stuff is literal. We believe that's going to happen. But we believe that the church is going to be raptured up with Christ. Christ is not going to come on earth yet, but he's going to come in the clouds. And First Thessalonians 4, 17 and 18 say that we're going to be caught up together with him. The word is harpazo in the Greek. It can be rendered raptured or caught up together. And, and then up there, he's going to transform us somehow. And then we're going to be with him for seven years at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're going to come back with Jesus Christ after the seven years uh, during the millennial reign to sort of kickstart the millennial reign and reign with Jesus. That's what we believe. We're premillennial. I think the majority of Christians are. There are others that aren't, but I think this lesson is, uh, you know, is, is not the, the time to talk about it. 
Does that make sense? Uh, there's so many other views out there. This is uh, the view that that uh, that we have, and I say it because this was one of the big things about Pastor Chuck Smith. He loved the end times all the way to his grave. He he was waiting for the rapture to happen. He kept teaching faithfully. He had his oxygen. He died. You know, he had he had a uh, you know lung cancer and. And he, he kept teaching till his last days. He had his oxygen tank up there, and he kept going. You know, faithfully, he kept the course. He ran the race faithfully. But he was always waiting. He was talking about his last days. He was always talking about Jesus coming back in the rapture because he was, he was that much closer to, to, you know, seeing Jesus. But what happened was that, obviously, he left us, and, and he went to be with Jesus in a different mode, but he's there now uh, with him. And I think he left a, a great legacy. He left a great legacy for us to follow, and we thank Jesus for for the, the unique wor work that he's done through, uh, through the Jesus uh, movement. And we thank him also for the, the unique work that he's done through other denominations throughout the years and other people that he's used. We don't, we don't uh, neglect those, uh, but we definitely want to emphasize why we believe what uh, we believe. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for, for your word and for your work among the body. We thank you, Jesus, because uh, you, you died for us on the cross. <clears throat> you rose again on the third day conquering death and, and sin. You've given us a spirit, Lord, to guide us, to teach us into all truth, to enable us, Lord, to, uh, to love on the body, Lord, and to, um, to preach the gospel. So we ask, Lord, that you be with us, Lord, that you enable us and that you fill us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless thee, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make His face to shine upon thee. I fought a good fight. I've been in there. I have finished now my course. And I have kept the faith. Oh, what an important thing to say when the time of departure gets close. And I look back at my life and I can say, well, I fought a good fight. I gave it in all I had. And I have finished the course. So, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, our righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing. May the Lord be with you and strengthen you for the various tests and trials that you'll be facing this week and cause you to be victorious more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ.